I wear two hats at the University of Washington. I'm a faculty member for half my time, doing research on college student drinking, marijuana use, other drug use, but importantly, I think, approaches to how we work with students on those issues. And the other half of my job, I work in student life, in health and wellness, and there, try and bring what the science says to our student body. Uh, I do direct work with intercollegiate athletics, fraternities and sororities, residence halls, and even our colleagues in the Counseling Center and Health Center, uh, training them in some of these brief, brief intervention strategies. Uh, over the course of today, uh, my hope was to talk a bit about some of the trends we're seeing, as well as highlighting some of the successes we've seen, particularly around college student drinking prevention, but bring up challenges. Um, I mean, I feel like I could talk about our experience around legalization all day, and of course I will not do that, but my hope was don't just go, look, here's Washington, have a good rest of your conference. My hope was if there are lessons learned, if there are things that you could, in theory, do tomorrow, what would those be? Um, I'm a big fan of top 10 lists, but I knew that because of the time I couldn't do that, so I, I made top six because of budget cuts. So there will be six uh, <laughs> suggestions, but I really do want to thank Amelia again. Marjorie Malpedi has been awesome to work with, and I appreciate your input and Dana Humphrey as well. This is from the Monitoring the Future study at the University of Michigan. This comes out the third week of June every year, and our most recent data on college students show that 79% of students report that they've consumed alcohol at least once in the past year. To me, there's two very important statistics to draw from that. One is the flip side. 21% of students don't drink. Whether they're lifelong abstainers, students in recovery, students that used to drink but it's been more than 12 months, I think it's hugely important that we make sure those students know they're not alone and feel supported in the decision to not drink. It's interesting, too, how often you hear normative misperceptions. If a well-intended person stands up in front of a group and says, listen, I know you're going to drink, so if you do, keep this in mind. I know you're going to drink is a normative misperception. Because for the one in five who don't, it's like, wow, is that what happens at this school? And since 78.9% of students aren't over 21, I know you're going to drink when addressing people under 21 sounds like permission giving. So we're very mindful about even messages that are, that are delivered. But um, it's keeping in mind that not everyone on college campuses drink, nor do they drink heavily. 60.7% uh, report they've been drunk at least once. In the past 30 days, now it's under two-thirds with any drinking, and under half, 40.8%, report having been drunk. Who gets our attention in conduct offices and administrations? You know, those folks. But what do most students do? 59.2%, the flip side of that bottom stat, either don't drink at all, or if they do, do so in a way that doesn't involve getting drunk. There's a lot of variability over the course of the year. Um, this, is a, this is my retirement, actually, <laughs> projections. Uh, this is a study out of Canada, where the black line on the top is weekly totals, the little line at the bottom are daily totals. There's so much variability over the cross of the years. So even not only when you collect data, when you screen, could result in very different answers. But I think there's clearly opportunities for event-specific prevention. In this particular study, Halloween fell on a Tuesday and was the biggest Tuesday in terms of quantity in the fall. The weekends preceding Halloween were the single biggest drinking weekends of the fall. That's coming up, two weeks. And so the opportunity to do event-specific prevention is obviously there. This is data from the National College Health Association uh, from the American, uh, pardon me, National College Health Assessment from the American College Health Association. I saw Mary Hoban earlier today, who we have so much appreciation for and does such important work nationwide. This is data from fall 2016 that showed that among undergrads who drink, the number one thing students who endorse doing something they later regretted. Um, that's the terminology there is important because that means they're saying something happened that I'm not happy with. Uh, and that's a foot in the door for us when it comes to prevention. 30% blacked out, forgot where they were or what they did. One in five had unprotected sex. 14% physically injured themselves. Other drugs are definitely being used. Uh, from monitoring the future, 42.8% uh, report past use of any illicit substance. If you just ask about marijuana, marijuana is driving a lot of that ship. 39.3% with any past year use. If you say any illicit drug other than marijuana, it's 19.7%. Obviously. 19.7 plus 39.3 doesn't equal 42.8. That means that there's poly substance use happening. We have students that report marijuana use and something else. There's over 40 drug categories in monitoring the future. Just to not have an insane slide with way too much, I drew a line at 5%. The only categories for pasture use that exceeded 5% were Adderall taken for non-medical reasons and then amphetamines, largely driven by non-medical use of other prescription stimulants. So do we see opiates, cocaine, molly, meth? Sure, but at much lower rates in terms of when you look at nationwide data. 
What's the good news? You know, when I first got into this field, I worked in Alan Marlatt's lab at the University of Washington, and the number of published studies we had that showed significant reductions in drinking and or related consequences among college students was zero. We're in a really different world now. Um, this came out in September of 2015, and I'll make sure my handouts are available as a PDF, but um, this website, um, collegedrinkingprevention.gov, from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, uh, amasses almost 60 individually and environmentally focused strategies. You know, when people say, I'm not sure what works in impacting college student drinking, this can be your shopping list. And the intent is, there's an ass assessment, you fill out what are we currently doing, and is there any data to support that it works? Are we offering things but we're not effectively getting people to them? If there are gaps, let's go shopping in College AIM and see what the gaps might be. If there's something we're offering that's really expensive but not very effective, perhaps is there even something that could be more effective? There are individual strategies on one matrix and environmental on the other. These are organized in columns by their relative cost and in rows by their effectiveness. Um, there are now eight strategies that are individually focused with higher effectiveness. When you look at environmental strategies, we've got um, five with higher effectiveness. Environmental strategies are very hard to evaluate because it's hard to tell like half a campus to be in a control group, for example, but uh, the data on this are, are very impressive. When people have asked me, what do you think is the most important thing in College AIM? It's a sentence on page five. They say a mix of strategies is best. And I think that's true. When people say we offer basics, brief alcohol screening and intervention for college students, awesome. What else are you offering? It needs to be a package deal. So we know it's not, you know, any one thing we do is part of an overall puzzle. College AIM gives you a chance to look at existing pieces, potential missing pieces, and where you might move to take your campus further. I want you to know that what you do about alcohol will pay dividends elsewhere. There's a nice uh, literature on the more that students drink, the more they experience things related to academic impacts. Again, I will, uh, Amelia has such great data on this, but data have shown that the more people drink, the more they report being tired all the time. And there's really good research on how alcohol affects sleep quality uh, and, and the lower their GPA is. Uh, another study showed that heavy drinking in general is associated with lower GPA and that students at research universities who are heavy episodic or binge drinkers are less likely to be engaged in faculty interactions. We know faculty interactions are a predictor of flourishing, even retention. And finally, it's not just binge drinking, but doing it often. Frequent binge drinking is associated with lower grades. Uh, right in this neck of the woods, uh, at SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration National Survey of Drug Use and Health, the NISDA. This looks at among people 18 years in, of, of age and older. And if you look, going from left to right, there's all adults, adults, any drinking in the last 30 days, at least one binge episode, and then doing it often, five or more binges at least once in the past 30 days. Defined as five or more drinks in a row, at least, at least once. Um, knowing that someone drinks does not necessarily increase their suicide risk. Knowing someone binge drinks does. You'll notice that for thoughts, plans, and attempts, the more heavily students binge, or, or people binge drink, the more we see that there's a risk for these to come up. This next slide is meant to be like almost unintelligible. It's stunning when you look at this. It's the presence of any of these thoughts of suicide plans or attempts as a function of uh, non-medical drug use. All adults are the little purple line on the left. The presence of other substances. If, someone, if we know someone's using other substances, this increases suicide risk. And it's not just knowing they use it, but are they meet, meeting criteria for potentially the need for treatment, a substance use disorder? I'm a data guy. This is stunning data to me. This is also from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Those with a past year substance use disorder, 12.7% compared to 3.3% without report serious thoughts of suicide. You see almost uh, a five-fold increase in making a suicide plan and a five-and-a-half time increase in attempting suicide. Uh, Lori Davidson, who's done work with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, I asked her if I could quote her on this. She's made the claim Good alcohol prevention is good suicide prevention. Because the more you can do on campus to reduce the really heavy drinking and the consequences that go along with that, that will pay dividends in those domains. Ken Sher, who's a big name at the University of Missouri, he's gone so far to say that if you can change norm perceptions about drinking, you will decrease suicidal behavior. The thing that scares me in my state, when you look at risk around marijuana use, 
Dr. Wayne Hall at the University of Queensland in Australia, who's been amazing to our state, and in my eyes, unbelievably generous to our college coalition. He has an article that said, we could make 13% of schizophrenia cases go away completely if marijuana use didn't happen. Look at what we're doing on college campuses about mental health and consider how scary that means when our communities vote to increase access to marijuana. I asked, I moderated a, a webinar that Dr. Hall did, and I said to him, this was April 2013, so we were just a few months into legalization. I said, if we could do one thing on college campuses in this world of legalization, what would it be? And his answer surprised me. He said, I would screen in college counseling centers for cannabis use disorder. He said, in our data, we see an inexplicable link between depression, cannabis use disorder, and suicide risk. We don't know what comes first. We don't know what drives what. But if a student is seeking help for depression and flags at being at risk for a cannabis use disorder, this person poses a suicide risk to you that we cannot explain. He said, if you have a waiting list, do not put them on the wait list. This becomes the immediate priority for assignment to a therapist. So as someone that works in a field where we've learned, don't just you know, come up with stuff. See what the science says works. What happens when the real world gets ahead of science? My job changed on November 6, 2012. Uh, the people of Washington uh, approved Initiative 502, which said that not only were we going to legalize use, possession of marijuana for people over 21, but that stores would actually be opening um, where anyone with a valid driver's license could go in and buy marijuana. Um, what was weird is that legalization happened 30 days after the election. And on December 6, 2012, they said, effective today, people are allowed to use marijuana and possess it. You're not allowed to use it in public, and just remember, you're not allowed to buy it, and you're not allowed to sell it. And people are like, wait, what? Well, then how are you supposed to get it? And they're like, you're not allowed to buy it, and you're not allowed to sell it, wink, wink, until the first store opens. The first store didn't open for 19 months. Talk about the explosion of an illicit market. It's mind-blowing, and I'm gonna try and not I will not editorialize. I will do everything I can to show you data just to give you a glimpse of where we are. What surprises me was when I hear people say, well, it's probably gonna to come to my state. Truthfully, fight back with science. If you're saying this is not something we want, the data can compellingly make the case why a state wouldn't have to go that way. Um, I've donated my time to every high school and middle school that I can because the, there's been such a lag. What was going to fund all these great prevention efforts? The money raised in stores. What happened? Stores didn't open forever. So I got asked to speak to ninth graders at Olympia High School. In my head, I was like, cool, I'll go in, talk, and we'll be done. I didn't know that it was back to back to back to back to back to back seven times. <laughs> ninth graders are a hoot, let me tell you. Um, right before, the teacher said, they have so many questions. I thought I would write them all up and send them to you. I'm like, that's awesome. They sent in about 50 questions, and all but one of them were amazingly good questions. One of them I didn't get. And I was like, is this kid messing with me? Complete, I cut and pasted it right from the email. This little kid wrote, is it true that smoking marijuana turns your lungs into orange slices? And I was like, I don't get it. I didn't know if it was slang, like, what up, orange slice? Like, I didn't know if that was slang for something. So I sent it to my colleagues. I'm like, anyone know what this is? And they're like, they're messing with you. I'm like, I don't think that's true. I want to believe that a 13-year-old's not going to be like, oh, 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 I'm going to show this guy. Like, so I did what anyone would do. I went on Reddit, the hotbed of all things science-based. And I found this thing, and I'm like, oh, God, that's hilarious. This guy on Reddit, as a joke, said, please forward this picture and save the life. Here are the lungs of a teenager who died from smoking marijuana. And it was this picture. Um, <laughs> the first person who replied was like, dude, that's an orange. And he wrote back in all capital letters and said, stop being disrespectful. That's a dead teenager's lungs. We can look at that and say, that's OK, that's an orange. But those ninth graders were like, oh, no, because <laughs> they thought that was really it. Um, more than anything now, I'm freaked out by oranges because they look a lot like lungs. Uh, <laughs> but one of the kids said, is marijuana different than when you were in high school? Now truthfully, there's not good science on that until after 1995. And I was in high school from 83 to 87. Uh, but I moisturized, so I put on this and figured those kids wouldn't know any different. And I'm like, well, here's the data from when I was in high school. <laughs> a little bit of a lie. Um, this came out in December. We believe that the stuff people used in the 70s, when you hear people say, I smoked grass, it's because it was practically grass. It was like 1% to 2% THC. Some people think that in the 80s, THC content is about 2 to 3%. The important thing to understand is, I've heard people say, I don't use drugs, but then they tell me they use marijuana every day, and I'm like, hold up. 
you said you don't use drugs. And they're like, well, it's not a drug, it's an herb. And it's like, no matter what you call it, it's got massive impact in the brain. If you look at all the areas in the brain uh, where we see different, very important neurological activity, this is where THC binds in the brain. This has massive impact on the brain. And what have we seen? THC content is changing. This is a different animal. In the 90s, THC content was 4%. It hit 6% by 2000, 8% by 2004 or 5. We started seeing double digits 2012, 13, 14. What's happening in states with legalization where there are dedicated state regulated growth areas so people aren't growing weed in the space between their neighbor's walls, there's no regulation on potency. This came out the third week of August and showed, uh, it's our impact report, the second one on marijuana legalization, it showed that in 2016, potency of THC was a never before seen in our nation, 13.18%. What is it in Seattle? 21.6%. If someone says to me for a million dollars, what does the science say about Washington weed and the human brain? I have no idea. This is an animal that has never been taken before, and never been studied before. Hash oils, concentrates, what people use for dabbing, never before seen 55.9% in the nation. It's pushing 72% in Seattle. I'm not trying to get cute when I plot us on here, but the y-axis only went to 14%. If you put Washington up here, that's where we'd be. There's some bad research out there, and it is not the fault of the researchers. Like, for example, trying to interpret marijuana and lung function research, it's hard. Why? Because so many people that use weed use tobacco. And we know tobacco causes lung problems. So when we look at the data, can we convincingly say that marijuana causes those lung problems? No, because of the confound. Some people go, hasn't been proven to cause lung problems. It's like, but it also hasn't not been. Like, we need to be mindful and think critically. And what better place to think critically of data than on college campuses? Where do we see the most clean data? Cognitive stuff which I think the data on this is not debatable in terms of its impact for college students. The part of the brain that affects, among other things, attention, concentration, and memory is the hippocampus. Truly long story short, after marijuana use, the neurons in the hippocampus get suppressed. They fire, but they fire at a rate that's lower and slower than they could or should be firing. Harrison Pope did research with college students where he tested them a day after they used marijuana. He said, I don't want to get students crazy high make them take a test and say, well, look what it did to their cognitive abilities. A day after marijuana use, and this is in 1996 with way less potent marijuana, there were measurable decreases in attention, concentration, and memory, and the more heavily a person used, the more pronounced those decreases were. Some critics said, well, you, that doesn't prove anything. What if people with attention deficits love weed? Which is a fair question. So he said, fine, we can test that. Ethically, we can't take people who don't use and make them start. But what if we take people who use every day and have them quit and pay them generously every day they stay clean? If we follow people over time and their cognitive abilities stay the same, yeah, they were probably there to start with. But if, they're, if as their drug use goes away, those cognitive abilities improve, that's causal. It takes four weeks, but 28 days after stopping daily marijuana use, there are no longer any measurable significant differences in cognitive performance compared to people who, a control group of people who don't use marijuana. Think about what that means on our campuses. Students that are like, I know I have ADHD, marijuana is the worst possible fit, period, because there's no drug in, more clearly associated with causing, not just worsening, but causing attention deficits than marijuana. If someone's like, I, my memory sucks, and I'm having a tough time this semester or quarter, or I wonder if I have ADD, can I have Adderall, and they're using marijuana, we can't pretend to diagnose if they do or don't have attention deficits if they're recreationally using a drug that causes attention deficits. One of my classmates as, as uh, undergrads, she looked at a study with 15 to 19 year olds that used every other day, 14 in the last 30 days. She showed that verbal learning takes two weeks to improve, verbal working memory three weeks, the attention seems to take the full four weeks. Amelia has done research that shows the more people are using, the more that is associated with academic impact. There is a clear scientific precursor as to why that might be. Uh, the hardest part of my job, um, I'm sleep deprived, and I'm really tired. I get mushy about this stuff, and this kills me that this is what we see in the state of Washington. Uh, driving after use, I get so tired of the people that joking are like, I drive better when I'm hot, and I'm like, not a single study in the world suggests that's true. Our state DUI was set at five nanograms of THC per milliliter of blood. Uh, for those over 21, and any positive amount for those under. Why did they pick five? Because you can see limited research that shows you have the same deficits in reaction time, and ability to shift focus with competing stimuli that we see at 0.08 for alcohol. 
We don't have breathalyzers for marijuana, so how long does it take to drop below that? One published study from 10 years ago with men only that averaged 154 pounds shows it takes three hours. If someone uses weed at nine and at 10, they're like, who wants to go out for food? They're driving under the influence. No different than driving drunk. Wayne Hall in that same webinar said, yeah, but that study's old. I would tell people five hours. That's just a recommendation. We needed to use the three hour window since it's in the published literature. We asked 2,101 18 to 25 year olds in Washington, have you used marijuana in the last 30 days? Those that said yes, we asked, have you driven under the influence? Of course not. Have you driven within three hours of use? Which is driving under the influence? 49% of them said yes. You do not see 49% of people who drink drive drunk. But 49% of people who use marijuana are driving under the influence. Summer of 2015, fatalities in my state with THC on board doubled in one year. That is a horrible, it's hard to make things double in one year. Fatalities with THC on board doubled. In April of this year, a report came out that showed that in Washington state, drug driving deaths have, pe have beat out drunk driving deaths. Bless you. That's a horrible finding. From a norm standpoint, we've known since the 40s that people are influenced by their subjective sense of what's going on rather than what's actually going on. We're influenced by our perception of what people think, feel, and do rather than they actually think, feel, and do. And sadly, our perceptions and interpretations aren't always accurate. I did a study where we saw that a third of students used marijuana, two thirds didn't. So what, are this what does the typical student do? They don't use. Only 2% of people got that right. People think everyone uses weed. And in our study, the more significant the misperception, the more that was associated with your own use and even consequences. Since that's now over 10 years old, we tried to replicate that with data in Washington State. Our rates of use among 18 and 25 year olds post legalization are higher than the rest of the nation. But what is, even in a state that's had legalization for almost five years, what do the data show? Most people don't use. I feel like there's this weird, like, get with the times, people, it's just weed and everyone's using. It's like, the people that are the huge marijuana fans are in the minority. Most people don't use. Granted, our rates are higher, but that's, that includes a lot of people that only use once. When we ask them, what do you think the typical person your age does? There's that 2% again. 98% of people think everyone uses weed. We've got about half that think the typical person uses weekly or more. So what are some of the things that contribute to norms related to marijuana in Washington and potentially elsewhere? Statements like, it's just weed, or it's not addictive, or it's safe. In the report that has just been released, there was data that showed that 54% of administrators report they've seen an, in, an increase in students that view marijuana as safe. The harms are out there, and we need to, get, if we're supposed to think critically on college campuses, we can get that research in people's hands. I will not name the state that this came from, but I had someone send this to me. It was a state legislator saying, maybe we should legalize marijuana in our state. And this is quoting directly from their report. I didn't do anything funky with their wording. They go, it's not even that addictive. A study by researchers at the National Institute on Drug Abuse found that among people who had ever used marijuana, 9% had experienced marijuana dependence at some point in their life. Well, my first reaction was, okay, so that was 23 years ago, with weed way less addictive, and we had different criteria for that. DSM-3R was in 87, and when I started grad school in 91, that's what we were using, but then we had to learn all new stuff when the DSM-4 came out. Then we had to learn all new stuff when the text revision came out. DSM-5 came out in 2013. What is that report that was cited? It in fact used the DSM-3R from 1987. It's not even the same stuff. And again, I'll say again, with weed that was completely a different animal than we see now. Uh, is it addictive? Yes. We have clear criteria in DSM-5 for a cannabis use disorder. God bless anybody in this room who has a family member or a loved one with a gravely disabling or potentially lethal condition who's had medical marijuana recommended and is using as recommended. That's not who I'm talking about. I worry how many kids on our campuses are reporting medical use of marijuana for things like depression and anxiety and are therefore declining referrals to counseling and health. When I think, we need to find out if these folks are addicted or not. Uh, my good friend Christine Lee at the University of Washington asked incoming first year students, tell us why you use marijuana. And they gave us lots of reasons. They said it's fun, helps me do something with my friends, helps me when I'm bored, uh, helps alter my perception, everyday activities are more enjoyable, it's cool, helps me celebrate. But they also said it helps me relax, helps me sleep, helps me cope when I'm depressed, helps me relieve stress, helps my appetite sucks, helps me reduce anxiety, helps when I have physical pain and headaches. What are the criteria for cannabis withdrawal in the DSM-5? Well, they include anxiety, sleep difficulty, appetite problems, depressed mood, and headaches. Emergence of a more visible open-air drug market. 
If you play the can you walk through Seattle and not smell weed game, it's not a game you're going to win very often. And unfortunately, when you smell it, you're like, God, this place is like a pot place. Um, after a very bad 420 in 2015, business owners went to the mayor and said, we're out. Downtown Seattle has become an open-air drug market. Do something about it. Again, didn't want to editorialize. I'm quoting straight from the Seattle Times article. City officials and business leaders say they're embarking on an ambitious effort to shut down open-air drug dealing and associated crime in Seattle's downtown core with this new nine-and-a-half block strategy. If you know Seattle well, there's Pike Place Market at the, on the left. Uh, Macy's is up there. Union Avenue is on the side. The mayor said Seattle residents and visitors should not be forced to navigate a dangerous open-air drug market between the downtown retail core and Pike Place Market. Keep in mind this is almost a year after stores had opened, because of course everyone said, well, the illicit market will go away if you legalize and open stores. Plainclothes police officers walked those nine and a half blocks. Every time they were offered drugs, they bought drugs, and then made the arrest. I don't know what number would impress you for drug arrests in one day in nine and a half blocks. 186 drug dealers. We are an open-air drug market. And that affects norms. That affects prevention. Advertisements and media, the proudest article I've ever been a part of. I'm a proud older brother. Uh, I have two little brothers. One um, is a professor at UNC Charlotte. And we got to publish together with Paul Grossberg, who's at Wisconsin, on the role of media in adolescent substance use. With alcohol, in a review of 13 studies, 12 of the 13 show that among kids, their exposure to TV, ads, movie portrayals is associated with increased initiation of drinking among abstainers and increased consumption among those already drinking. What do we have in our state? Ads seemingly everywhere. If you landed, if you flew through SeaTac Airport when University Place hosted the US Open, they had a guide to the 18 holes and the 19th hole was a marijuana ad. Decisions and messaging by parents. Again, I'm not a parent, so maybe I shouldn't be allowed to criticize, but again, our state's invested a lot in Start Talking Now. In our Young Adult Health Survey, we asked people, if you've used marijuana, where have you gotten it? In 2016, we saw a significant increase. 12% of 18 to 20 year olds said they got marijuana from their parents with their permission. Our healthy youth survey, sophomores in high school, if someone says pick the one slide that tells the most amazing story, kids that think their parents think it's wrong for them to use, only 13% of sophomores used in the last 30 days. Over half that think their parents think it's not wrong report past 30 day use. 30, there's double the rate in people that think their community thinks it's not wrong. With College Parents Matter, again, with what Amelia has done, the more we can enlist parents, the better. So what are the opportunities on college campuses? I know we started late. I had 45 minutes, and I'm going to end perfectly on time, but these were my six suggestions. One, and especially if you're in a position from a leadership standpoint to support having this happen, support efforts to both support those who may be struggling with substance use and, as well, identify students that may be struggling who might otherwise slip through the cracks. One in five students meets past your criteria for an alcohol use disorder. 3.9% of those with an alcohol use disorder receive services of any kind. 96% aren't getting anything. There's a lot of good research on brief interventions that use motivational interviewing. They're non-judgmental, non-confrontational. They elicit personally relevant reasons for change and can look at ways to change behavior. The goals include altering trajectories, providing early intervention. If it's in line with what motivates the person, prompting contemplation of change, or commitment to change or even initial action, reducing the resistance or defensiveness, and exploring behavior change strategies. This will be in the handouts. If you're in a position to screen, the Q to R is eight items long. And it starts with a yes, no. Have you used any cannabis over the past six months? If no, you're done. If yes, their score on these eight items can give you a glimpse of is this a person struggling with marijuana use. If you're just doing it casually, keep in mind about how you word things. Do you smoke marijuana is a yes, no question, and the person who uses edibles every day can look you in the eye and say, nope, and you miss their daily use. We have to say, do you use marijuana, have you used marijuana, followed by what does your marijuana use look like? Again, non-judgmental, non-confrontational. I have the honor of running the mandated student groups at the University of Washington for students that have violated marijuana policy. I'll start by asking those folks, what are the good things about marijuana use for you? And they will tell me. What are some of the not so good things related to your marijuana use? How long a list do I get from them? Very short. Just to illustrate the point, two back-to-back -back groups, I eliminated the duplicates, there's my list. It bugs me when people say college students don't see harms, they think it's safe. I disagree. I think it's how we word it, how we call it. If I started that group and I'm like, all right, everybody, I'm Jason, I'm gonna be working with you. Let's talk about the problems you have with marijuana. What problems have you had? 
I don't have any problems, nice vest, thank you. Um, I got it at L.L. Bean. Um, what are the good things? What are the not so good things? Scott Walters at the University of North Texas said, heads up clinicians, we found that in our studies, it was the clinicians killing this list. They'd get a list of about four or five things and then the provider would go, great, anything else? Which is a closed-ended yes, no question, which is code for, let's wrap this up. When you ask what else, the student will keep generating it. Christi I'm second author on a study Christine Lee did that did a brief intervention using personalized graphic feedback for marijuana. We gave feedback on lots of things, including norms, motives. This was the stimulus package funding where we had to start spending when we got the money. We didn't want to start spending because six month follow up was during the summer when everyone went home. And we were convinced both control and intervention would get better. And that's precisely what happened. It's not that the intervention stopped working, it's that everyone got better when they went home. But at three month follow up, we saw significant reductions in amount used, time spent high, even consequences. These aren't people who just want to be left alone. In our young adult health survey, we see that those using weekly or more, over half have tried to set limits on their use and almost 40% have tried to make a change. So there is research that shows brief motivational interventions show promise. I've been collecting pilot data on our marijuana and other drug workshop for mandated students. Christine Lee's brief intervention works. Plus, there's a chance to provide education about addiction and withdrawal in our health and counseling centers. I love this quote. The use of effective interventions without implementation strategies is like serum without a syringe. The cure is available, but the delivery system is not. If you have interventions that work, are you getting people to them effectively? How might you get them? Screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. I come in for a flu shot, I take a screen. People that flag could get offered. Bystander interventions. The Jed Foundation has research that shows that 75% of peers say that they would turn to a friend first if they were struggling. What that friend does next is huge. Mandated students. Do we have good brief interventions for our mandated students? Yes. How do we get them there? Enforce policy. And proactive outreach. In health and wellness, if I see someone's been transported to the hospital, I do outreach. They didn't get in trouble. They're over 21. Our state has a good Samaritan law, but I check in to see what's going on. Enforce laws and policies. There was a question, how much a barrier do you think each of the following presents to successful marijuana prevention and enforcement on your campus? And 55% of administrators said it was at least a minor barrier. I'm willing to say, I don't know that that's true. I think that there's the potential that there's a normative misperception. Levine and colleagues show that a small group of students, the ones that are really loud, could be quite vocal to the point administrators withhold policy changes assumed to be unsupported by the student body. But Bob Saltz, our friend from California, says he found a universal tendency to underestimate student support for policies. Most people don't use. Most of your residence hall students don't want to smell weed on their floor. But who are the ones saying, get with the times, that's what everyone's doing? The minority of people that are blatant enough to use it in a residence hall floor. We can shut that down. And I'm not talking about in a like witch hunt, let's nail everybody way. But in a, if there are laws, we have to enforce them. Bob says, campuses would actually have more incipient support for a variety of alcohol prevention policies than is likely to be perceived by the students themselves, and by extension, administrators and others belonging to the campus community. Unless students are persuaded that such support is not limited to a fringe element, New policies are likely to be met with at least passive, if not active, resistance. This then suggests that today's campus prevention interventions, which now often comprise campaigns to correct students' perception of peer alcohol consumption, may want to incorporate a parallel effort to correct their perception of peer support for policies as well. This information may prove revelatory to some <clears throat> and critical to the chances of having a significant impact on problems on campus. If you have that data on support for policies, that's an injunctive norm opportunity. Respond to testimonials and address unwanted effects with science. Do make sure people understand there's a difference between no evidence and insufficient or inconclusive evidence. The lung function research is inconclusive. Doesn't mean there's not any evidence. And get the science out there. You know, the munchies. 95% um, of students that use weekly or more said, I had that and I did not like that. I watch what I eat and I eat crap when I'm high. I hate my body image and I'm gaining weight because I'm hungry all the time. There's a science behind what that is, and if people choose to stop, that will go away. Motivation, trouble remembering, there's science out there. Correct misperceived norms. Most people aren't using, they're not driving. <clears throat> you saw 49% of those with monthly use drive, but if you look at the whole population, most aren't. The more people use, the more they think others are using, and there's a chance to address positive community norms, like the important work Jeff Linkenbach does. I worked with providing our King County data to the neighborhood house who have launched a norm campaign about what King County youth do, young adults do. Um, most aren't using, most aren't driving. 
I also want to show you that if you can change norms and if you can increase perception of harm, that will pay dividends. In addition to collecting data every year in new cross sections, we have people we followed longitudinally. We have people we followed now for four years, but at the three year mark, we tried to see were there data at time one that we could use to actually predict their marijuana use at time three? Yes, there's five variables. The more risky students see regular marijuana use, the less likely they are to use. The more risky they see regular marijuana use around physical risk, the less likely they are to use. The more difficult to obtain marijuana, the less likely they are to use. The more they see it as unacceptable, the less likely they are to use. And the higher they perceive that everyone's using, the more likely they are to use. We could predict any use, weekly use, and even consequences by knowing those five variables. We can't do a lot about ease of access with stores opening, but we can with enforcement. We can absolutely address perceived physical risk and psychological risk and descriptive norms. Involve parents. Again, right here in your state, you've got a link that we share nationally with College Parents Matter, but teach them how to communicate their hopes and values to their kids, make sure they understand why that matters, highlight normative misperceptions about what other parents think when relevant. And finally, what you do about marijuana use on campus should be in addition to, not in lieu of, what you do with alcohol. You know, might one state be doing a lot about opiates? Sure, but that should be a complement to other things, not in place of. So, wow, this is exactly 45 minutes. I'm, I'm impressed that I got through this. Um, we, our work isn't done. Have we made some big gains? Sure, but we need to do more research on retention of students and examining how substance use affects that. The strategies in college aim that work, we can do. The ones with less research, we need to do more work on. What's the best package? If a mix of strategies is best, what's the best mix? What cultural adaptations need to be made in increasingly diverse student bodies, especially with international students? The overlap of alcohol and other health issues, including the person I tag team with the most on our campus is our sexual assault and relationship violence prevention specialist. Uh, overlap of alcohol and other substance use. Um, I have so many people go, when's the marijuana matrix coming out? We don't have that. We don't have that body of literature. So more research on effective prevention and intervention for marijuana. And finally, uh, more research on effective prevention and intervention for non-medical use of stimulants. Um, we have a grant along with Amelia's team, Dolores Cimini's team in Albany, and we're testing that right now. My last slide, I had, uh, my brother told me about an anthropology class that he took, and he said something to me that hit me so hard. He said um, that Margaret Mead was asked, um, what's the first sign you look, you look for to tell you of an ancient civilization? How do you know they were civilized? Was it some instrument, a tool, an article of clothing? And her answer was, a healed femur, your thigh bone. If you broke your femur, you're, you were done, unless someone took the time to help you set that, take care of you, and make sure you got back to health. We have a lot of broken femurs on our college campuses, and I hope no one in this room ever questions the value you have. I mean, who are the people to heal them? The very people in this room. Our colleagues back at campus. Our students that are such thoughtful bystanders. Uh, I hope no one ever questions the value of prevention and what you do about this, because it does make a difference in so many people's lives. My email address is there. Um, if there's an article I referenced, or if you're like, I want them to send me that, I will be happy to do that. Um, there's the website for our research center and my student life group. I already thank the three folks that were most uh, involved in having me come here. I want to thank Shannon Bailey and Mary Larimer at the University of Washington. I get to do this weird 50-50 split because of their creativity, and I, I feel honored by that. I didn't remember that I was going to be seeing Kevin, and so I'm glad I put this up here that he gets to hear it. No, really. The national leadership you provide as president of NASPA, which is the biggest student affairs group we have, matters so much. Your letter, things you've sent out in the last two months, I've had forwarded to me to him. This guy's a hero to people that do work in prevention, and you really are. I can't make that more clear. Uh, thanks to, uh, to the Mary Christie Foundation, the Hazleton and Betty Ford. Uh, that was 133 slides in 45 minutes. How do I drop this microphone? So thank you for the chance to present to you today.